Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson and you are watching RPV City Talk. It's great to have here in studio the mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes, Mayor John Cruikshank. Here we go again. Thanks for joining us. How are you? How's life as mayor? Uh, it's really good. Thank <laughs> you so much, Liz. Um, you know, in regards to being mayor, I'm always humbled every time I'm, I'm called mayor because I, I tell people I'm kind of the stealth mayor because when things are going well, that means we're doing our job. And really, I'm, you know, one of five council members. Really, the only difference is, is that I do facilitate. You're in charge. <laughs> well, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, I, I run, I help run the meetings. Uh, but of course, around me is an amazing city staff and, and the residents participating. That really helps the meetings go by and, and get the right information so that we could facilitate it. So for me, I'm really enjoying myself as mayor. Well, you're very humble and we appreciate what you do because it is a lot of work. And I think residents um, don't understand. I mean, you're technically volunteers and you have your other life, your family, your work. So there's a lot happening and we've been super busy in February. Um, let's just take a look like we always do to let residents know um, sort of the latest and greatest things that are happening in the city, starting big news at City Hall. The council officially approved the next city manager, R. Morani, and big congratulations. He's officially now our city manager. Exciting decision for the council. What were the qualities that you were deciding upon really to give Ara this top post? So in regards to Ara, I mean, Ara Moranian is uh, going to be a tremendous city manager. We, of course, went through the process of interviewing four candidates, Ara being one of them. And really what the city council was looking for was to keep the consistency going. We have a number of senior staff that actually left mm -hmm. after Doug Wilmore had left our city and went to the private sector. Of course, our assistant city manager, Gabby Yap, had left and Deborah Cullen, our finance director. So those are three key people that left our city. So having that consistency in someone with the institutional knowledge, the reality is is that our city of Rancho Palos Verdes is a city that revolves around planning and planning things is super important, you know, all the different things we have. And Aura grew up as a planner with our city, has been with us for more than 20 years. And so at the end of the day, even though all four candidates probably would have done a great job, Aura really did come up on top and we all support him. And now that he is on board, you talk about those senior posts that have vacant are vacant. He'll have that ability now because the way our city runs is the city council will hire two people, the city attorney, city manager, and then the city manager fills the rest of those big posts. So, That's right. So we can stay tuned to see who deputy city manager, finance director, some big hires ahead. That's right. I mean, Ara, as a, a new city manager, I've told him, you know, it's great that he's kind of doing so many things right now and understanding all these different departments more than he probably ever has, but he's going to need assistance to help him. And at the end of the day, a city manager needs good supporting staff, and we're going to let Ara build that staff. And he certainly hit the ground running. We were just talking before we started the show, like Choa, the Council of Homeowners, had him come and give a state of the city. Um, and of course, he's involved with everything the city is doing. He had a workshop in February, a goals workshop with council and staff. Let's go right to that then in February and how that went into sort of looking at the 2020 goals for the city. Tell us about that workshop. Sure. So we started this process last year and we were able to actually put many of the city goals into six major categories, um, public safety being one of them. There's five others. And, and so we kind of set up a framework last year to start developing goals at this time of year so that the council and the community and the city staff can really figure out what is it we should be focusing on and uh, spending our time on. We only have a little more than 60 employees right now in our entire city of 42,000 plus. So we really have to pick and choose the right things to be doing for the city. And so uh, with that, we actually went through a number of things. And I have a list or kind of a recap. We had 55 goals that we had and 18 were completed and it's not goals that are just for each year I mean these are goals some of them are ones you can get finished within a year and many of them are goals that have uh, gone on for 20 years or more no 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 that's <laughs> very true I mean there, there's things that we've recently had finalized like mm -hmm. the NCCP and right. the general plan these are items that have been worked on for decades you know I've been on the council for three years and done a lot. I, I'm honored to have helped get to the end, but there were so many people before us that got us all the way to this point. And, and certain items that cities or governments work on do take a long time because they need to be done correctly and with the right input. And, and timing has a lot to do with it as well. 
But some of our, our goals that we had, we wanted to acquire and retrofit the streetlights uh, from Southern California Edison, and we've done that. We had a, a land use restriction for the Civic Center, and where we couldn't use all of the property for the things we wanted to, only a certain portion, and that took an actual act of Congress to get that done. And that was done by you know something that started well before I was on the council and finally got done, and so it opens up a lot more opportunities for us at the Civic Center. We uh, created an advisory board work plan. So well, what's that? Well, um, you know, we have all these wonderful committees and planning commission, mm -hmm. uh, but we wanted to provide some more uh, guidelines to them so that they knew the framework in which they uh, were working within, just like the city council developed the same thing for ourselves to, mm -hmm. to follow. We also, like I mentioned, we adopted the Natural Communities Conservation Plan, Habitat Conservation Plan, the NCCP and, yeah. slash HCP, and those two... We're not going to give our residents a test on that. No, we won't give a test, and I actually had to read it, to too, because I just call it NCCP. Yes. But the NCCP part is the state of California, and the HCP part is actually the federal government, and it gives us the guidelines to... to um, utilize our projects within those guidelines, kind of a master plan for that. So we had a number of uh, goals. We actually, the zone two code amendments at the uh, non-monks properties within the moratorium area. In Portuguese ban. Yeah, past uh, that EIR was, uh, so lots of things have been moving forward. Um, the new goals, some of the new goals. So Councilman Bradley, uh, who was also on the Planning Commission, wants to create a citywide 5G master plan. As we all know, antennas have been a big part of our community discussion. Mm -hmm. And 5G actually requires even more antennas. And so if we want to continue to use not only our cell phones, but the whole you know, smart car technology and Internet of Things, we're going to need to have more antennas and does that really mean the ugly poles we see or does it mean maybe something else? And so there seems to be technologies are starting to find other ways where maybe you have antennas inside cars or a whole satellite system that I believe Elon Musk wants to pursue. Mm -hmm. So we want to talk about that. Actually, we've moved the city council meeting to the Wednesday because the third is actually election night right. for the primaries. So because of that, we moved our city council meeting to Wednesday the 4th. And that's the evening where we'll be actually going through all the list of the goals we developed and, and figuring out what's the priority of those. So mm -hmm. we haven't determined yet. Some of those goals might actually come off for now, but Got it's it. going to be a council discussion. So what were some of the other goals you were looking at that will come up at this March um, meeting? So some good ones. Right now, the Coast Guard has recently vacated their property at the Lighthouse. So we want to figure out maybe there's a potential city use for that property. Mm -hmm. We uh, want to negotiate an agreement with the school district to reintroduce the student and the law program at the high schools. Um, we want to engage in a regional emergency preparedness plan and conduct exercises with all four peninsula cities. There's potential uh, mitigation plan for reducing operating speeds of vehicles throughout the city. We've had many city council meetings where people talk about speeding vehicles and traffic issues. And so, you know, we want to figure out how we can potentially help people drive a little bit safer in our city so that we don't have accidents. So residents interested in looking at the shaping of goals, they should come to this meeting and, and pay attention more to what's happening then. And, and Please. Then, yes. Please. Excellent, excellent. So overall, were you pleased as mayor running that meeting, just sort of what came out of that workshop? Because you have lots of subjects and topics that you could be addressing right now in the we, city. We do. I mean, I, I think when you have a new city manager, you got to be careful about how far you branch out mm -hmm. of the things you really should be doing. Um, I, I told Ara this, that we want to make sure that we do not overwhelm him and his fairly new staff that he's building. Um, because there are important things that need to continue to go on and our staff needs to continue to do those. They, they don't want to drop those and start doing something new mm -hmm. at the expense of just doing something new and shiny out there. Um, I'll tell you what I was really encouraged about was the first workshop. We had a lot of the public there at the meeting. Um, other than you getting a little bit of footage you might be showing during this talk uh, where you're getting video footage of us having that meeting, we told the people it's not going to be you know, recorded for it to be uh, so people, on, on RPV TV. People could talk freely and openly, and we had a great discussion. And the other nice thing was that all the department heads in our city had an opportunity to talk and tell us what they were thinking and feeling because at the end of the day, they're the ones that have to execute these 
ideas and plans, mm -hmm. and we want to kind of hear from them, you know, how they feel about it. So I thought the meeting was very well run. Excellent. And I was there. I thought you covered a lot of ground, and it was actually exciting to see the goals that you've completed and what's what's shaping up for the next months ahead. So with that, let's move ahead to uh, talking about you, you met twice in February city council meetings. You covered a lot of ground. February 18th meeting, the most exciting thing I think I witnessed on the agenda was that the city council approved the uh, having a traffic light go in at Via Rivera and Hawthorne Boulevard. It's an issue that's come up for now 20 years in the city being discussed about the safety at that intersection. So go at it. Just explain to the residents like what this situation was and how you're addressing it as a council. Sure. It actually surprised me a bit that it had been 20 years they had started talking yeah. about it. So the situation is this. So Hawthorne Boulevard, as we know, is a state highway. It's also a major thoroughfare. And it's a lot of topography, so there's downhill traffic and uphill traffic. And the interesting thing is, is that you would just logically think, oh, downhill traffic is going to be the fastest. But a lot of times it's the uphill traffic. And this particular intersection at Via Rivera is very close to the Golden Cove uh, Shopping Center mm -hmm. and very close to Palos Verdes Drive South. And so you have a lot of vehicular activity that goes on just in and around those two areas. And you have the residents that are within the Via Rivera area trying to leave their homes to get to work or to go shopping or just get out of their house. And there's a school down there as well. Yeah, right. And mm -hmm. then so when Golden Cove first started, it was not a school there. Mm -hmm. And so now it's a Montessori school that's there, and, and there's a lot of the rush hour traffic for schools, you know, the 8, 8.30 in the morning time frame, and then the afternoons when uh, students are getting picked up. So what's occurred now is you have a lot of backup, you have a lot of frustration from residents trying to leave their neighborhood, and because they have to look both ways and there's cars moving fast, it has made it very difficult for them. And so we were very fortunate to have a full house of residents show up at the meeting and they all gave testimony on different situations and their concerns. The city finally did approve a, a traffic signal at that location. And it really, there, there really wasn't anyone that was against that. The traffic studies had already warranted that a traffic signal be put there. Um, it will take a bit for the traffic signal to be designed and built. But in the interim, we've asked the city to look into maybe some temporary measures to maybe reduce the amount of car platooning or speeding mm -hmm. in that area. Well, I know you mentioned the Traffic Safety Committee, that that was warranted so that for our residents that are trying to figure out, well, when do you get it? Everybody, There's a lot of people that we watch say, oh, I wish I had a light at my, at my street coming out of. So when that, that process, you have it, it's studied to see, is it warranted? And so that... That went in years ago. They actually decided this that a light would be warranted there, correct? Well, and, and so in fairness to past councils and me being on one of those decision-making bodies that did not pass a signal prior, um, so a, traf a traffic engineer licensed in California would uh, study each of the intersections that they're asked to study, and they determine whether or not a traffic signal would be warranted or required by the um, different types of criteria they use. Um, because we're working on the Civic Center, which is just up the street on Hawthorne Boulevard, um, and because that is looked at in terms of potential emergency operations, with an emergency operations situation and you have fire trucks mm -hmm. uh, coming out of that uh, location, there'll need to be a traffic signal there too. So now you've got three traffic signals in a row starting at the bottom of the hill at, at uh, PV Drive South. And so that was the concern of prior councils. We wanted to make sure we were getting that correct. The Traffic Safety Committee went back and looked at it. The chairperson of that committee, Larry Liu, was at our meeting. Mm -hmm. He said that they all are in agreement that a traffic signal should be placed there. And his criteria was good. He said, look, it's important, obviously, to not have too many signals, but the Civic Center might be more than a year out, and right. that's clearly going to be more than a year out. So let's go ahead and take care of it now before. Because some of the other options they were you were considering was, okay, well, we'll just, at a peak hour, 7 to 9 in the morning at that intersection or later in the day, you just can only take a right turn out of that neighborhood, and I think the residents weren't thrilled about that. So I think you worked weren't. you worked with that issue as well. So. Well, they, they weren't. I mean, it was looked at if, if instead of making that left across Hawthorne Boulevard and and potentially in front of a, a vehicle that's traveling up the hill. Um, it was studied of if you made a right, then a U-turn. But the reality was, and the residents that came to spoke were correct, that 
you're not really solving the problem because you have such a left turn movement going into that school and into Golden Cove that, that you're really probably making it worse. Right. And so the bottom line is about a year from now, we'll probably see that light up and running. Is that the timeline? Obviously, the hope is less than that. Um, we do source uh, a lot of the equipment or contractors source a lot of the equipment overseas. Um, so it does take a while to order that equipment. And mm -hmm. like I mentioned, it hasn't even been designed yet. The design will be obviously quicker than the purchase and installation. But I think the goal would probably be to maybe by the, the school season of next year, not, not this current school season. Well, like that was a packed council meeting and people walked away with a sigh of relief. That's for sure. It's, I, I you believe could feel so. that energy in the I room. Um, so also more sort of traffic related, safety related issues that came up that you addressed. Um, there's been discussion ongoing about a project that would be off PV Drive East um, at Bronco and Headlands. It's actually an equestrian trail project, but also traffic safety and all that. Explain that project and sort of where you're at with that. Sure. Well, so Palos Verdes Drive East, which is now on the other side of the hill, yeah. <laughs> is a, a road everyone's driven uh, Palos Verdes Drive East in our city, and they know it's a very windy road. And windy road with lots of streets coming into it, and there's even driveways coming out onto Palos Verdes Drive East. There's areas where you really don't even feel safe going faster than 15 miles an hour just because of how much curvature there is. And we've identified that there's some real traffic hotspots in that area, and we've had some accidents along there just because it's a fairly tricky road. And so that our traffic safety committee has had several meetings on adding a crossing for equestrians so the equestrians can, we can continue to build that trail network and complete that one day, hopefully. Um, of course, pedestrians now are walking behind guardrail and it's not always the best situation for them. You have people on bicycles that are trying to mm -hmm. ride safely and then you have the cars and then you have driveways coming out and streets. So. Uh, from a traffic perspective, it's almost one of the worst situations you could have because there's just so much going on. And, and a lot of the discussions has been where do you even put that crossing? And part of the issue has been that uh, for people to actually get access to Palos Verdes Drive East, they, their driveways have to kind of cut through public property mm -hmm. to get to them. Some couple homes and, there. and there's some topography where you, know, you can't just it's if you look down at a plan it looks all good with lines but then when you actually go out there you'll see that there's steep driveways and that so you can't you can't just cut into those driveways without mm -hmm. ruining access to people's homes so there's a real balance with that too uh, and there's some new homeowners there that showed up at our meeting uh, and they they got involved with the process and so the council felt like it would be best that you know we're getting close but you continued it but we continued it so that we can allow some of the new homeowners that are there to work with some of the existing the older homeowners mm -hmm. not older like an age but that have been there longer uh, so that they can come up with a situation that they feel uh, will work for them in their in their neighborhood so that will be coming up again down the road It'll be yeah. there down the road. And uh, one more uh, traffic-related um, item that came before the council was another intersection, was talking a lot of traffic today, Crest Ridge and Middlecrest? And Middlecrest. It's a three-way stop, oh. so off of Crenshaw. Right. Uh, right off of the, there, there's an area where there's no stop signs, or there wasn't until a few days ago. Okay. And I think the price tag it. on that project was like $750 or something. Well, it was that? funny no? because it's <laughs> the, the, the staff said it was, the budget, it was 233 thousand and we're like well what's all that about for three stops but, but you know that's for an overall I see you know and, and so uh, I think it was <laughs> yeah it was only like 75 bucks a sign or, or something so, yeah, so the yeah. price tag was low but you know of course residents in that area um, it's a blind curve mm -hmm. and so at any speed it would be almost impossible to see what's oncoming so I think with safety being the number one concern of, of, of our council um, and because it was warranted by the uh, by a traffic engineer, um, we felt you know let, let's mm -hmm. go ahead and add that three-way stop. Okay, so public safety we're talking really is sort of paramount with everything we're talking about. Your top priority, um, obviously, as a council, you continuously I think adding resources and working on ways to help the community become safer. So the quarterly statistics were out, um, where the uh, sheriffs. Uh, Captain Powers releases quarterly figures, and I think overall, while there was an uptick in burglaries, we saw crime overall down in the city, so that's good news. Here's just your thoughts on where we're going with crime prevention, public safety, what you want residents to be aware of. 
Sure. So the total number of residential burglaries and thefts uh, for 2019 was less than the previous year, mm -hmm. like you said. Um, so it has been trending downward for the last four or five years. And the reason it's increased is uh, Lameda Sheriff and private security measures such as the ring devices. Uh, this past weekend we had uh, right. another rebate session so people could buy the, the ring devices for their homes. I think people are being vigilant in their neighborhoods, um, but we, you know, of course, safety is a huge concern. In our parks and reserves, we're adding forests or ranger, rangers again. So um, we are going to have them patrolling as well. And, and fortunately, the automatic license plate readers, the ALPRs, have been a tremendous resource for us, allowing our sheriffs to immediately know when there's a, a vehicle that's on the, the list and they know where they're at. In terms of our crime prevention efforts, is there anything else you want to see the city doing and or just more of the same? And obviously, when um, you see something, say something, working with neighbors and all that. Well, well, clearly, we need to continue to have our residents be vigilant. And, mm -hmm. and you know, if they see something and they need to call, contact the sheriff's department and let them know if something's going on. I think that uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Eric Alegria, he's doing a really great job with the regional law group. And, and I, I'd like to see us continue to work with the other uh, peninsula cities and, and Lameda and Los Angeles to really look at it from a, a team effort. Right. You mentioned Ring. And um, the city is once again partnering with Ring. There are different systems now that you can buy through Ring. And we had, I was there at Hess Park. It was very successful. A lot of residents showed up to take advantage of a subsidy. And I just want to let residents know that if you're interested, you can contact um, Shane Lee, um, who's our contact at City Hall. So he wants us to give that out at slee at rpvca.gov. So you just email Shane and he can give you all the information if you're interested in hooking a ring video doorbell up and you want to find out about it. He's the contact for the city. Did you and install one at your I, house? Yeah, I had actually. My son was visiting. So I always put my kids to work when they're back visiting. Um, now that they moved Good. out. I should so, do that. So we had him install it. And I have a hardwired um, doorbell. So it's a little more challenging, but within about a half an hour, it took him just sort of, you know, uh, rigging it all together. And you have to download an app. And boom, it was there, and there was my son, and I could see everybody coming to from my, you know, so it's really a great nice. tool. Um, that's how sort of how it functions. You know who's at your front door. You can see partly the street as well. So that was interesting. You can kind of see any that's action. Great. So it's a great way to um, help protect your home, but your neighborhood. Um, when you have these, any kind of security system, right, that's helpful. And law enforcement, I know I've talked to, um, was talking to Captain Powers. It's, it, they've been really effective in uh, residents being able to provide video um, for solving cases. I mean, it's actually helped land arrests. So they work. So you need to get one. No. Oh, okay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but there's, you know, anything you can do to extra protect your home, right? So even if you've got the barking dog or there's just lots of ways, things we can do to help. Well, I'm not going to advocate barking dogs. No, <laughs> that's true. I don't <laughs> not not near my house. Gotcha, gotcha. But so, but the city is kind of moving, moving forward. And also we mentioned the a ALPRs. We'll still be installing those yes. um, automatic license plate readers in the Western Ave area, right? That's, That's sort of next. And those have been really effective been in, in, um, in tracking cars and that, are, that are wanted, that are vehicles that are coming into our city. Right. And just so people know, the ALPRs are we're reading the uh, actual digits on the uh, license plate. They're not taking videos of people driving or that. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. Of course, the city is always working in ways to help prepare our residents for emergencies. And one new program that the city is involved with is called Alert South Bay. So explain what this, this program is all about and how residents can become involved. So the Alert South Bay, it's a multi-jurisdictional emergency notification system. And what it's great is, is that it not only is our city, but it's all the surrounding cities around us. And mm -hmm. so basically what one would do is you would text the word, it's all one word, alert SB, to 888-777. And when you do that, they send back to you the instructions and the link so that you could get the, uh, the software on your phone. Mm -hmm. And what you end up with on your phone is uh, a software that's called Everbridge. Okay. And once you open Everbridge, then what you end up with is a map you typically see just like you're on Google Maps. And so in this particular case, Rolling Hills Estates has an outline around it in Redondo Beach. Mm -hmm. And the reason they have that now is because they've already been activated. Mm -hmm. And so fairly soon in the next week or two, our city will have an outline. And when you hit the outline of your city, you get at the bottom of your screen all the public safety alerts that come up. 
And so it'll be a good way to kind of eliminate all the different systems we have and consolidate it all into one. So what's your hope that this will provide to residents? Over the last several weeks, we've had several issues in regards to emergency type work going on on our city streets. Mm -hmm. And not only our city streets, but the surrounding streets. And what that does is create traffic and issues for our residents. And so we, of course, hear about that. And what my hope is, is that people get used to using a system like this and maybe before they're heading home or they're heading out of their house, they could take a look and hope to avoid some of those areas where there might be some activity or some construction going on. And it just gives us a potential other tool to make our lives a little bit better. Excellent, excellent. This is a great tool, all these things that we can be doing, um, including getting your emergency preparedness backpack kit um, at the Point Vicente Interpretive Center so that you are prepared at home. Right. Yeah, we've got... That's right. We've got <laughs> stuff for everyone here. Um, I'm going to move on now just because as we're wrapping up the show, as mayor, just things that you're looking forward to on the agenda is upcoming, any issues you want to be tackling, and then more about just any announcements you might have. Sure. So for me, uh, I know we've all, and the city manager's been putting it on there, his weekly report about the regional housing numbers. And for me, I think this is something that could greatly affect our city, and we all, we all need to be participating in that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the concern has always been state dictating to cities what to do, and I am definitely not a believer in one-size-fits-all. Our, our city is, is, is unique as the next city. Um, I think our... Uh, we have ways to tackle the housing issue uh, in a way that I think will, in many ways, that can work for us as, as Rancho Palos Verdes residents. And so I would like to have lots of discussions on that so we could find ways to do that. Um, also, some of the other things I, I'm looking at, Western Avenue is a huge deal for, for our city. Um, Want to figure out how to, to uh, start to eliminate mm -hmm. traffic issues and also uh, make it look better. It's not the greatest looking street in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's basically one of the entryways to our, our city. So in the last month, I've uh, had the opportunity to, to do many things. I Obviously, communicating with our residents is the number one thing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people do reach out to me in calls and, and emails and that. Um, I want, I've, I've been able to participate in some legislative meet and greets with our state and local leaders and hear what's going on there. Um, the South Bay COG, I'm a board member with their steering committee. Mm -hmm. And with that, we're able to start focusing on the things like housing and transportation and how we tackle both of those huge issues. Um, and then finally, I had lunch with Asia Powell. She's our uh, uh, liaison for the California Public Utilities Committee. And uh, the, the five member statewide committee, they really do want to know what, what's going on in Rancho Palos Verdes to help us with our utilities. You're out there networking, and of course, your monthly uh, meeting with the, uh, you do your monthly mayor's breakfast at I Trump, do. that's coming up. So that is a successful way for you to also find out what is happening with the committees and commissions. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we meet monthly, usually myself and one of the other council members. And then all the committee uh, chair people uh, attend that meeting along with city manager mm -hmm. and our captain. They have a chance to tell us what's going on with their committees and their groups. And so it, it keeps us informed of, of all the things that are going on. Because they're, they're actually holding their own meetings and getting community input. Right. And in fact, I was jumping around, but at your um, last council meeting in February, you had a report on the biannual uh, report from all your committees and commissions or your committees about sort of what they're doing. And so, I mean, they're doing a lot. <laughs> they, they, well, they are doing a lot, and, and but I, the, the council doesn't want them feeling like they're working in a vacuum. We need them to know that we really value what they're doing, and, and we want them to tell us what we should be working mm -hmm. on. And that way we have an opportunity to let them be a part of the goals and action plan versus us dictating to everyone what we think. We're just five people. And right? you also have liaisons to each committee with each council member do. if you're doing that, which is helpful. We do. Right. We want to make sure that they have someone to talk to if they need to. We are. You're good. We're all out of time. But just uh, last minute mayor's announcements. I know, believe it or not, we got Whale of a Day coming up in April uh, the 18th. It's the 18th. So everyone, please attend Whale of a Day at Point Vicente uh, Interpreter Center and um, really enjoy being mayor. All right, I want to thank you, Mayor John Cruikshank, for being here and joining us on RPV City Talk. I'm Liz Brown Swanson. Thanks for watching. See you next time.